Okay. For those of you that have not been to one of these events before, my name is Melanie Brooks and I am the audience coordinator at the Bangor Daily News. And I am excited that I'm joined tonight by two of my colleagues at the BDN, photojournalists Linda kono and Troy Bennett. Um, we all work in different areas of Maine, so this is really the first time I've, I've met Troy and seen him face to face, so this is really exciting. I want to kick off this event by thanking our event partner, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, and those of you that are joining who are subscribers. Your support means Linda and Troy can continue to travel the state of Maine with their cameras to take amazing photographs to illustrate and complement our news stories. So like I said, you are all muted, and I'm gonna ask that you keep yourself in this mode during our presentation. Um, Linda and Troy are going to take turns talking about a selection of their photographs, and it's just easier to hear them if we are all on mute. If you do have questions, which you might have as we go throughout this presentation, please leave them in the chat function. And um, I'm sending everybody a message in the chat right now that says hello. If you don't know where to find it, if you move your mouse around, there's a button at the bottom that's a little chat bubble. And you can leave questions there and we will get to them after the presentation. Um, we already have some that have been emailed in, so I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. So before I move on, I want to take a moment to introduce our special guests. Linda is a Marylander turned Mainer. She studied photojournalism at Western Kentucky University and has worked in newspapers since 1993. Before working at the BDN, she worked for um, newspapers around the country, including the Allentown Morning Call, the Seattle Times, and the Baltimore Sun. And her favorite parts of being a photojournalist are meeting interesting people, visiting new places, and having new experiences. Troy is a Buxton native and longtime Portland resident. He got his first newspaper job at the age of 29, and his work has appeared in media outlets all over the world. His favorite part of being a journalist in Maine is the endless parade of interesting people he gets to meet and photograph. So, you know, they both have very similar reasons why they love their job. And as we go throughout this presentation, um, we'll hear more about that. So if you could give me a minute, I am going to start sharing my screen and we're gonna start off with Troy's photos and he will walk us through the stories behind some of his iconic images that he took this summer. So, hold tight. All right, Troy, when you're ready for me to change the slide, you just let me know. All right, uh, thanks for having me on. It's, um, it's a pleasure really to, uh, I don't know, maybe like demystify a little bit of what I do. I like talking about it. And I think Linda and I are both uh, in the business, I think we just said because we both like to meet interesting people and the, uh, being a photojournalist in a, a newspaper, it gives you a license. Like your camera is your excuse to, uh, to talk to strangers in a way that um, I would never meet most people. I would not walk backwards in front of these people here for four miles if I didn't have a camera in my hand. I, cho I chose these, uh, how many pictures are there, four or five? Yeah, and uh, I chose these because it's just what happened this summer. These are all photographs from Portland from the Black Lives Matter uh, protests that went on mostly in June, I think. And uh, I, I mean, I've photographed lots of things all over Maine, but I just picked these five because they're the things that happened the most recent and they kind of illustrate everything that I do uh, all together uh, in, the, uh, in this sort of news biz. And they are like, you make portraits, uh, you, you photograph things as they unfold, sort of in real time. Uh, you meet people, and uh, and you you know get to make pictures of them and, and invade their lives for a small amount of time if you can. And it's always interesting. So this is a this is Congress Street here in my city, where I've lived for the past uh, more than twenty years, I guess. I grew up about eleven miles outside of town, a little southwest of here in Buxton, which used to be kind of rural, but now it's more like a suburb. But I've lived in here, and uh, these are my neighbors. Uh, I live in the neighborhood where a lot of these people live, and so I recognize a lot of faces. I walk around downtown uh, to get my bagels, or I did in the you know before times. Although the bagel place is back open now, but 
so we hear this thing's going to happen and you just got to go and find out what's going on. And this is a photo that illustrates where I have to photograph a lot in a very short amount of time because they're marching pretty fast and I'm walking backwards in front of them uh, for, geez, it must've been a mile or so holding a lot of this. My hammer's, my camera's up over my head here. I'm just sort of holding it up and, uh, and shooting and, and it's a lot of frames to sort of get this. And I'm looking for faces always. I'm always looking for faces. I'm looking for the photo that's going to tell the story of what was happening that day. So what's the emotion that's going on? What's the sort of kinetic energy? I like the way the guy's hand is holding that megaphone off to the side. And he's got the cord stretched way out. Like he's just uh, pumped it up there uh, like a fist, like everybody else has their fist up. A lot of these sorts of shots you get like this. Uh, somebody's looking at their phone in the corner or somebody's uh, just told a joke and it doesn't really fit the story. So yeah, you end up shooting a lot of frames and this ends up being very physical kind of work. I'm, I'm, I'm not quite 50 years old and uh, I'm, I'm like six foot one and I weigh like 240 pounds. So walking backwards for a mile is not the easiest thing for me to do. <laughs> I'm afraid uh, that if I was any more out of shape, I wouldn't be able to do this job, but um this was pretty physical. I don't know. Usually people ask me questions in real time. So does anybody, Linda, do you have a question for me? Can you unmute yourself, Linda, and jump in here and help me out? Mute myself? Yeah. yeah. No, it's hard just talking to, to yourself. Isn't I it? know. It's <laughs> Usually I'm in a, in a room with people and they're, they're shouting questions at me. So, hey, Linda, how are you? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Do you cover protests too, right? <laughs> yes. Actually, I haven't had any of these this summer, though. I... Natalie's had a couple, but I haven't been to, and we haven't no. had anything in Bangor like you have in Portland, but. But it's just um, like you see in the movie, right? You run backwards in front of yeah. them, holding your camera up over your head. It's like, it's just what you think it is. Yep. Yeah. Because they're not stopping and I have to stay ahead of them the entire time for like as long as they march. Thank goodness they stopped a bunch of times. This happened in Portland three, four times and I covered one in, Bang in uh, Augusta as well. So uh, anyway, we can have the next slide now, please. So this is like a portrait. So I could find all the things that I normally find in assignments. Um, so that, that, that last one was almost like that could be shooting sports. That could be um, a news event. And a portrait, I usually try to uh, isolate a subject, right? And sometimes they're posing for me on their porch a lot of times right now in these uh, COVID times. I don't go to anybody's house anymore. And sometimes I make a portrait sort of on the fly as it happens and just technical detail. I shot this with a 200 millimeter lens sort of zoomed all the way out into 200 millimeters. And I shot at a shallow depth of field because that would make the background go all fuzzy. And, uh, and I wanted to isolate this, this woman. And it's almost like a, um, it's almost like a glamorous picture. You know, she's, she's dressed up for this, for this event. Um, and, uh, and she's got some really cool sunglasses on and she's taking care of her hair and her nails and, and it's got a little bit of jewelry on. But at the same time, I try to show that she, she's angry, you know, about something. And in a picture like this, you can't tell what she's angry about usually. Could be anywhere in the world, except you might be able to see a BLM uh, uh, stamp on her wrist maybe, but that's where I think captions come in. But you can also tell it's these times because she's got the mask down around her... Uh, down around her chin there. And uh, so they, uh, the, the first photo was like trying to show the group, right? It's like, there's a big thing happening. And then while you're there, you can shoot portraits of individual uh, people to show that it's not just a mass of people, it's a mass of, of individual people. Yeah, if that makes sense. Does that make sense, Linda? Yes, it does. You do the same thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we do probably the same kind of stuff. But, uh, oh, what's the next picture? I can't remember. Oh, this one. This is down on Commercial Street. Uh, it's the big wide street down by the water. And uh, I shot this on purpose. Um, I shot it with a long lens again. So I got way back to try to fuzz out the background, but not too much because I wanted to show that it's thousands of people that showed up. Uh, I've covered uh, protests all over Maine for, I don't know, over 20 years. And usually a big one is a couple hundred people, but this was, this was thousands, probably two or three, two or 3000 people uh, on commercial street. And I've only covered maybe one bigger in my career here in Maine. 
and that would be uh, the Women's March back four years ago, which was something like 22,000 people in Portland. I'll never shoot anything like that again. It was huge. But so in this kind of photo, I want it to be readable as, as fast as possible for somebody to see this, because I, I think this led the story. Um, you could see this woman. She obviously has a sign that just says Black Lives Matter, which is a really good shorthand for what's going on here. Uh, but she's got her mask on and she has separated herself a little bit and she's quite kind of in the sunshine, whereas people in the back are in the shadow. That's just because she happens to be between these two buildings. And she's got her hand behind her back, sort of mimicking what happened to uh, George Floyd. Uh, and I sent this one in from the scene uh, and they used this to lead the story for, I think the rest of the night. And I got a little bit of criticism for this. And I don't know if you can guess why I got a little criticism for this. And that's, because she's a she's a white lady down front and the all the organizers who were had the bullhorns and were doing most of the talking were all african-american uh because it's who was leading it but i just thought that this was a better picture <laughs> and sometimes it's a, it's a, you got to make these kind of big decisions that you're going to get um someone will second guess you later on and they have every right to and i second guess myself maybe i shouldn't have maybe this wasn't the one i should have sent in but I thought her eyes were in focus. They were kind of intense. It had the sign. She had her hand behind her back. She was sort of standing out, but also in the giant crowd. And I only have a few minutes to make that kind of decision what to send in as we, we're going to talk more about that, about our workflow uh, later, I think. But uh, well, that's that photo anyway. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> and this is at the same protest. And this is what I call the, the photo you didn't, remember to look for you probably didn't but i happen to remember to look for this photo is is when you got a big um a big deal going on and maybe it's a big basketball game or a big march like this or this just something crazy happening a lot of times if you turn around and look at the people who are looking just like i am at the uh, at what's going on there's something really telling over there and in a basketball game, it could be the little kid who's dressed all in the school colors and jumping up and down, and he's going to be real enthusiastic and cute or something like that. But in this case, I looked over at, this is a, it's a bar, it's, it's a bar on Commercial Street. It's the Commercial Street Pub. It's a, sort of a, a thoughtfully known as one of the three doors of death, uh, these really uh, historically uh, um, rough uh, bars on this on this row on commercial street that are full of fishermen and bikers uh, this lady i turned around and uh, i happened to look and um there she was making the heart symbols throwing her support to the marchers which is maybe not something i would have thought would be happening at the commercial street pub um and the only thing i wish i wish i had more depth of field and i'm pointing at the screen as if you can see me but i wish that the uh i wish the people marching by in the reflection were um or more in focus. Uh, it, it wasn't enough light um, for me to get like F8, which would have made everything more in focus. Because if it did, that would have been killer. And I could have won a, a prize for that because I think it would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a good, I think, illustration of like, mm, almost. Mm. Okay, it's an all right photo, but. Mm, eh. And this is the last one from that day because it had been an incredibly tension filled, very long march with people over and over again lying down in the street and mimicking themselves being you know asphyxiated and it's very very tense and they got to the park and they had some speakers and they were going to take a break for a second um to get ready to have more sort of poets come up and talk and it was all real heavy poetry real heavy stuff and the guy who was running the sound system started playing music and he started playing i i'm too old to recognize the song but it was some song that every one of those the sort of young people knew and the next thing you know there's a dance party breaking out and it was it was uh incredibly cathartic uh for the folks who were taking part in this protest because they like i said it was so heavy and they were doing it for like six hours straight i think it was a very long protest they were doing it really long on purpose and then they formed this thing that you only used to see on dance shows on television where they sort of form a big circle and then people took, tan took turns uh, dancing in and out of the middle of the circle and everybody um, sort of cheering them on. And it was, um, 
it was i think it was cathartic for me too because i had been uh it would it, it, it had been it had been really um intense before that and then she's wearing this shirt that says hip-hop is bigger than the government which i think is the, it still makes me smile i didn't even notice she was wearing that until i looked at the photographs later and we got a guy with black lives matter and look and it's all people of color which is what the whole thing was about so at least i got that in there um yeah all right so there those are my yeah. five photos they're all from that from that from that couple of weeks here in portland in this in the uh in june and there's going to be another one uh this weekend that i'm going to cover another black lives matter uh protest so there you go take it away linda Thank you so much, Troy. I'm going to switch sure. over to uh, Linda's photos and take, take it away. Linda's right. Oh, boy. All right. So I did not do a collection of photos from one event. Um, I just picked different individual photos that I liked for one reason or another. Um, some of them are very simple, like this first one here. It's, it's a simple line of photos. Uh, a line of people, I'm sorry, standing at the fence watching Air Force One take off. Um, and it was, it was such a simple photograph, but there was something that I loved about it because of the simplicity. It's a straight line of people and that the airplane is just over, you know, the top of the fence. It was nothing, there's nothing crazy behind it. Um, it was a, it was a big day. There were a lot of protests that day. It's when President Trump was in town and went to Guilford. Um, I was, stationed in Bangor for the day to photograph him um, in, a, in a round table discussion at the airport. And then from there, um, he went to Guilford and we had somebody else photographing there. So then I just came back at the end of the day to see what might be happening. And that's what I found. People came out to wait to watch Air Force One take off. Um, so just to me, it was just the end of a day that was full of all kinds of different emotions. <laughs> um, and this was just very, it was it's simple and it seemed kind of lighthearted. This too got like Troy's pictures. People will, you know, get upset about different things. And um, people were upset about this photo as well. Um, not because Wait. it was Air Force One, but because it was Donald Trump. <laughs> so that one caused a stink. A lot of things do for, you know, one reason or another. Um, this photograph here was um, a portrait that I had to take of these two girls who were um, very strong and came to speak out against the racism they experienced at Bangor High School um, through, their, through their whole four years. Um, when they graduated, they came out and spoke to the Bangor Daily and talked about things that had happened. Since that story has come out, many changes are happen happening at Bangor High School. Um, it had been brought to their attention throughout, you know, in different ways, but uh, sometimes it takes a big way for things to change. Um, and these students were very brave and they they took a stand um, and I had a photo shoot with these two girls. This was one of the ones that I liked quite a bit. I have some where they're both in focus, but you know, we ran a, a selection. There was quite several photos that ran of the two of them. Um, the girl that's out of focus in this one, there was one of her by herself as well, but there was something that I liked about this one with the depth of field and focusing on the one girl in the background um, just to give it a different feel. Okay, so this is, uh, this is called Corona Mencement. This was at University of Maine, and I love this picture. It was, it was, they had so much fun with a really crappy situation. Um, they weren't getting a graduation from college, so this group of kids, uh, one girl was leading it, and um, her and a couple friends, and they, they made their own just quick, um, they called a Corona Mencement for their own graduation from college and they had um, blank diplomas and they just hand them out to people and they had the sanitizer they had the whole thing they they had a really good time with it and I enjoy that I love when people can make the most out of something that is could otherwise be pretty bad um, it was sad for them they didn't you know they spend their four years in college or more 
um, like myself, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and then you get to graduate and you don't get to graduate. So they they were having a good time with it. This guy in the middle, I loved it. I mean, how can that not grab your attention? Um, it was just fun, and and I like that one. It kind of uh, it it spoke volumes for the kids that were making the most of this and how their college time ended. Um, okay, so this was it. This is actually one of my favorites. This was at Tall Pines in Belfast. Um, and they, if you recall, they had a lot of um, sadness there during coronavirus. And um, this, I was actually there not to shoot these people. I was meeting um, a husband and wife who were there visiting uh, her mother. And we had it all arranged to go and meet them. Uh, they were gonna be visiting her mom through the window. And when I'm driving around to look for them, because I didn't know them, I see this. And I am looking, and I'm wondering if this is the people that I'm supposed to photograph um, to find out that it was not. I, she turned around to ask me you know, who I was. And so I asked her what her name was and if she was who I was looking for, and she told me it wasn't. So I went to find who I needed to meet and I photographed them and then I had to go back because it was, it was just a cold dreary day. The woman's wrapped up in a blanket and I was like, it was, it was wonderful for, I knew, I knew this was going to be what I wanted to photograph. So after I got finished shooting who I was there to shoot, I went back around and talked to the lady that's wrapped in the blanket and she was very open to talking to myself and the reporter. Um, and being photographed. So I hung out with them for a little while. And then this one, they're talking on the phone together. She's got her cell phone in her blanket and she's talking to her mom. And when her mom looked up at her, like I have all these photos where they're nice, but it was the minute they made eye contact. And, and I was like, that was, that was my shot that it was, it was very sad, but it was very sweet. And um, it, it, if, it had a lot of different emotions in it for me um, that they couldn't actually hold, hold hands or touch or anything, but um, it was a very nice moment between the two of them. And this is, there's no big story to this. <laughs> this was on an assignment in Washington County. Uh, I don't really remember what the assignment was now, but driving back from the shoot, uh, when you see a scene like this in Maine, you can't not pull off the road and jump out and take photos. I mean, these beautiful horses and the lights hitting them and the, the fall colors. There's nothing like Maine in the fall. Um, this is why I've stayed here. Maine is the best. The beauty, the people, everything about Maine. And it's just, to me, that is beautiful Maine right there. Quintessential Maine in the fall. Yep. Awesome. Well, I'm going to stop sharing. And we'll come back. Hi, everybody. Linda, Troy, thank you so much for sharing those photos. I loved hearing your stories behind them. Um, maybe we can kick off the question portion of this um, by having you tell everybody what what your process is um, when you <laughs> when you have an assignment. Um, and I, I'm, I'm assuming it's different depending on the assignment. But um, how how do you as a photojournalist what are the steps to your job? You fly by the seat of your pants. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> First you say, oh my God, I don't have time to do that. And then, <laughs> and then you figure it out. I, I always badger, if it comes from a reporter or, or an editor, I just badger them to say, what's the story about? What's it really about? Like, what's the point of the story? What's the, what's the headline gonna be? What's the, what's the lead? And, and then, cause uh, d we get asked to do lots of portraits, don't we, Linda? Yeah. And especially these days, and it's like, oh, I'm going to photograph somebody on their front porch again. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. How am I going to make this mean something? Right. Or what do they do and, and shoot them doing what they do instead of a portrait? Wouldn't that be nice always? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes there's not time or sometimes, especially these days, we can't go in to, where, to watch them do what they're doing sometimes. Right. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Just always trying to tell the story, whatever the story is. So who gets and to pick... I'm sorry, when you send in your photos, um, who picks what's used in the paper or online? 
Do you get to pick or do, the, well, do your editors get to well, pick? Like, do you have any say in it? Oh, yeah, we have a lot yeah. to say, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, when I first started, I don't know about you, Linda, but I'd, I'd come back from an assignment with my film and process it, and then the photo editor would look at the picture, the negatives and pick whatever right. the photo was going to be. I had no input into it. But now we do all the first cuts, and we give the story – sometimes four or five photos and then they, usually it's pretty obvious which one the lead photo is though isn't it yeah it is and nothing's going to be published that we don't it's something that we're going to like enough that we have edited it and put it into our system for them to use otherwise they're not even going to see it absolutely so ron wants to know what kind of cameras you both use <laughs> we knew you were going to ask that yeah, of course <laughs> <laughs> Well, Linda and I are adversarial a little bit because I I have a can I use Canon cameras. I have this a 5D Mark III. I have a couple of these. And what do you use, Linda? And I'm an, I'm a Nikon shooter. I've I've always shot Nikon only because <laughs> Jack <laughs> only because when I was in college, the first camera that I bought and could afford it was a used one that somebody was selling was a Nikon. Um, and then you know you get your lenses. And then I've always just been Nikon ever since. I shoot um, the, I have two 610s. Yeah, same story here. It was v pretty random. I, I brought, this is the camera that I started on. It was my dad's 35 millimeter Canon. So when I bought my first camera, I just bought a Canon because my dad had one. And then, you know, a few years later, you have a bunch of lenses and there's no turning back. <laughs> um, Larry had emailed in a question earlier and was asked, wondering how you both decided to get into journalism. What inspired you at the beginning of your career? Troy? No, you go ahead. I don't really have a good story. Well, <laughs> mine was just by chance. Uh, it's not what I planned to do. Um, it's not what I, when I originally went to college, my whole life I was, I was going to, I was going into veterinary medicine and, um, that's what I went to undergraduate school for. And I went to college in Montana and uh, it was my first, we were on quarters out there. My first quarter there, I had to sign up for an elective and I'm just looking through the classes and I thought, Oh, well, take a, this photo class. And my dad had a um, Minolta X 700 and he sent it out to me to use to, we had to have a camera to shoot um, for the class. And it was that class and it, it changed everything. And I, my major changed. They didn't have photojournalism there. It was all art photography. I did large format, um, four by five photography. Um, it was really lovely. The print quality was amazing, but it was not enough energy for me. I needed to do something more. Um, I needed to be busier. And so then I heard, of, you know, looked into photojournalism and then I transferred to, a, uh, to Western Kentucky. Wow. I was going to be an English teacher. Uh, so I went to college to become an English teacher. And there was an ad in the paper, uh, the school paper, that they would pay you if you knew how to develop film, which I happened <laughs> to know how to develop film. And I walked in and said, uh, I'm here about the job developing film. And the editor rushed up to me with these two rolls of Triax. And he said, here, quick, develop these and don't, you know, them up. <laughs> and so... <laughs> <laughs> don't screw them up and so I developed those two rolls of film for him and then I never left the paper I still got my English degree but I never did any of the education courses And you had a in your bio that you sent me had a string of jobs that you had before everything oh. you said required heavy lifting well you I didn't go to flowers <laughs> I didn't go to college till I was into my mid to late 20s so I got out of high school and did lots of things and I think I mentioned before that I'm I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a big guy. So I always got these jobs where I had to lift heavy objects in warehouses or landscaping or something. So I was anxious to get out, to get to college eventually when I was like 20, I was like 26 or something like that so that I could stop doing jobs that made me lift heavy things. So sure. but these cameras are pretty heavy, but. Mm. Kim has a question about getting permission to take photos. So Troy, you were at a public event. Um, what, when do you need to get permission and when do you not because you're out and about in public? That's a very good question and one, one I get all the time. Uh, the answer is you or me or anybody can photograph anybody or anything that you see 
from the street or the or a sidewalk with a you know uh, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy when you're out and about in the world anybody can photograph you that being said um in the daily newspaper biz when we're doing routine assignments we generally wouldn't publish anything that um, somebody didn't like give us their name for. Unless you're at a news event, if it's a big newsy thing like these protests, there's no way I can get everybody's name at these protests, but they're out on the street at a protest. So they're fair game. And sometimes people complain about that and I have to give them this speech. (laughs) It's not always the most pleasant, but is that about right, Linda? It is. Yeah. I mean, we always try and get people's names. Um, which in turn is them giving us permission. You know, they know who we are, who we're, or who we're with. Um, and yeah, there are times where you just can't because it's, things are moving too fast and they are out in a public place. And then it's, it's just representing the event that's taking place. But I would say majority of the time we are able to get, get people's names. It's a good sign of good quality community journalism to get people's names. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, do either of you get criticisms from the public? And if so, how do you handle them? No, I don't think anyone's mm-hmm. ever criticized me. No, no never. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, especially in the internet. It used to be you'd get yeah. letters to the editor and you'd once in a while, but now getting criticized is like every day. So the trick is to actually try to pay attention to a, to a little bit because they some of it may be valid, but also letting most of it just kind of roll off. Is that right? Yeah, and I'd say typically it's not really about, it's not how, complaints aren't typically about you, yourself, and how you handle yourself in a situation. It's about the photo that they see and what they don't like about it. I've I've not had a... I've not done anything horrible to anybody where they've made complaints about me, but, um, you know, people have complained about photos, you know, before. We have a couple of questions in the chat about your assignments. So are you given an assignment every day? Do you get to choose what you're going to be photographing and how closely do you work with writers and editors on things that you are assigned? Hmm. That's a good one. (laughs) <laughs> it's a little mix of everything, actually. Um, we are back now to, I'm happy to say, that we work, it always used to be the photographers and reporters would go out most of the time together on stories because you collaborate so well when you're together. Your, your photos and your story come together as one piece. Um, and it makes for a better package. Then there was a time where everybody was going their own way, doing their own individual things, and I, a lot of it just didn't mesh very well. Um, I myself do a lot uh, with reporters and we go on stories together. They always turn out better. Uh, myself, I don't work with editors much at all. Um, we know we don't have a photo ed- editor anymore. We submit our stuff. Um, Natalie Williams takes care of uh, the beautiful presentation of our photos and how they look online. Um, Then there's another group of people who um, lay out the print paper. Um, So there's, there's a lot of different people that are involved in it. Uh, Mostly I just work with reporters or I'm on my own. Yeah. It used to be really hierarchical, but everything is sort of all scattered these days. The stuff happens in all sorts of, sometimes you get a really specific thing somebody wants. Or sometimes they say, uh, talk to the reporter, there might be something going on. And uh, me down here in Portland, sort of on my own, there aren't a lot of reporters anywhere near me. So I end up doing a lot of writing too. Um, But as a photographer, I try to write about things that I could photograph. So (laughs) I work really well with myself, I think. (laughs) (laughs) So you are using your camera to take pictures of people. So what kind of what kind of people skills do you need in your jobs um, on a daily basis? You need all of them. <laughs> all of them. Don't, don't be a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> no, you just, I think you just have to be, it has to be, chatting with strangers has to kind of come naturally. 
You have to be comfortable with being make actually the key is not you being comfortable with them, but them being comfortable with you. And and sometimes you gotta I don't know, spend a little time with people before you start photographing. <laughs> I am I am sixty percent more friendly when I'm holding my camera than I am in real life. <laughs> um, I I used to think when I was getting into this that I was gonna be a fly on the wall everywhere I went. No one would ever know I was there. I'm gonna really get this picture but it turns out that everybody knows that I'm there because I'm you know I look like me and I have a giant camera so usually you're just really friendly with people sometimes you push a little bit but in a really friendly way always in a really friendly way I mean it doesn't work otherwise What's that saying you catch more flies with honey yeah um, you, you you can be you can be persistent but still be friendly about it yeah um so someone had, had emailed in earlier, how has the proliferation of smartphones and technology changed how you do your jobs? I was thinking about that. I saw that question earlier and um, I don't think it doesn't hurt me any, any. I mean, everyone's got a phone now and they're holding it up, but I'm still one of only two photographers at the Bangor Daily News. So we were talking a little we're, bit earlier. We're hanging in there, I guess. Yeah. I, my phone, I've, I've shot news assignments with this when I've had to, and I send in pictures from the field with it all the time. I have a little device that plugs into it where I can plug my memory card in. And I think almost all of those photos we looked at earlier, I sent in from my phone um, on the go. And it's a lot easier to... I, when I got into this business, Linda, I had a pager and they would page me and then I would have to find a pay phone to call back. Oh, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I think it's a net gain for, for me anyway. It's yeah, it's true. <laughs> have either of you ever covered anything where you have felt unsafe? Um, I'm thinking maybe, maybe not the recent um, protest that you covered, Troy, but any other times when you have felt unsafe doing your job? Yeah. <laughs> I felt unsafe all sorts of times. Uh, a, a little bit. There was a late night in June there where the, it was getting rough. The police were shooting paintballs at people. I felt a little unsafe mm -hmm. there. But I've also felt safe on the front of lobster boats and up scaffolding. And it doesn't have to be people menacing you. But once in a while, people menace you. How about you, Linda? I've been menaced. Yeah. Yeah, I've been chased with a baseball bat. Whoa. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, sometimes that wasn't actually, he wasn't chasing me. He was chasing the man that I was photographing, but I was there. Wow. So yeah, I don't know. People get a little crazy sometimes. Um, Frank Bragg uh, is in this meeting and he said, I see Jack Loftus is on this call. Maybe he can give us a historical perspective. Yes. Jack, do you want to <laughs> chime in? Introduce yourself and chime in. <laughs> You just have to unmute yourself. You see where to do that? There you go. Thank you. And thank you, Frank. Um, hi, Linda. Hi, Troy. Nice meeting you. Uh, Linda uh, and I have been acquainted from uh, past professional experiences. Yeah, uh, you guys uh, both do great work. Uh, I love it. Uh, I'm a little critical of you editors who don't use your images large enough. <laughs> and I think Thank you should you. use more of your work and probably a little less words. But I, that may be the trend of where the paper is going today and, and uh, the website. But, uh, you know, uh, overall, I think uh, things are going in the right direction. And uh, you folks are... Uh, well-rounded and continue to do great work. Um, thank you, Jack. Thank, thank you. you. Troy and Linda, for anybody that's on this call that works in education or is a student, what, what kind of tips would you give someone who wants to become a photojournalist and get into this line of work? What's your biggest tip, Linda? Oh, I'm trying to think. <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, hmm. Don't give up. <laughs> yeah. There's, uh, I mean, I, I, I got into this 
rate when people told me newspapers were dying the first time. So yeah, they've been saying that for a while. <laughs> forever. So uh, things aren't like they used to be, but what is? So I don't know. Just shoot a lot and be critical of yourself and don't give up. And you got to be bold. You got to be bold, but it's got to be a friendly bold. <laughs> What can you add to that, Linda? That's not very good. Um, (laughs) I don't know if it's, if it's something that you love doing, then you just, you got to be persistent and move forward. It's, it's a harder profession to get into as far, at least in the newspaper world, because newspapers are shrinking, but um, photojournalism is. Yeah. I feel incredibly lucky. Don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're just so much smaller. When I, when I started, um, one of the newspapers I worked at, there were 21 photographers and, uh, they have seven now. And it's like, you know, in the Bangor daily, we, we used to have seven of us and now there's Troy and I, and it's just, th- times are changing. and It's, it's definitely, um, it's a new world in newspapers. Huh? Totally agree. But don't give up. You can oh, no. You no, can my it. gosh. There's nothing better to do, honestly. There, there really isn't. I tell, <laughs> it's the best. I tell people sometimes that it's three things for me anyway. I'm like relatively good at it. Uh, and I'm relatively like flexible and, and I keep saying friendly, but like, you know, can do. But the third part is I'm also just incredibly lucky mm-hmm. to have stayed doing this because it's really the I, only job I've ever wanted to do. So. Yeah. Um, Robin has a question about who has the rights to the images that you take for the BDN. The BDN. <laughs> the BDN. Yep. Which is okay, but it doesn't bother me. No. I mean, they're news photos. They're usually only fresh for a very short amount of time. It's not, what, what, what am I going to do with them? <laughs> so when you're not taking photos, what are you guys, what are you doing in your, in your life when you're, when you're not behind the camera for work? What are you guys doing for fun? I go in the woods. I think, yeah, we're both outdoorsy, I believe. We are. Yeah. I like camping and motorcycles and canoes and fishing and stuff like that. Yeah. Enjoying the main woods. My dog. <laughs> yeah. So other than, um, you know, as, as we're in COVID times, other than not going in people's homes, what are some other ways that this pandemic has changed how you are able to do your job? What's different now than it was before March? Hmm. What, we, what we do is all about, um, to a certain extent, it's about access, getting access to people's lives and convincing them that they can trust us with photographing themselves and doing things a lot. And it's not just their homes that we're shut out of. We, it's hard to see people working or going to a doctor's appointment or think about all the great photojournalism pictures you've seen over the past, you know, 50 years and you, you're right up close to somebody in their house or at their, at a, at a game or it's, I don't know what we're going to do as it, especially as it gets colder. It seems like a big deal, a big problem. Doesn't it Linda? Well, Tori, I think it's very different where you are. I think Portland's, I think it's a lot different down there. Um, are you getting access? Yeah, I I've only had um, two people since since March that did not want me. One came outside and he only wanted me to photograph him outside, and another one I photographed through the window. Um, otherwise, most people up here, I haven't run into too many problems, masks and you know, and not getting in their space. Um, they were still people are still letting me in their homes. Um, but it, it's different here than, than how it is for you in Portland. There's almost nobody on the street here in downtown who's not wearing a mask, even outdoors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it must be different. Yeah. We have um, about 15 minutes left before it's 6 o'clock. If anyone else has a question, I welcome you to go ahead and unmute yourself and um, go ahead and ask. You know, we've heard my voice a lot, so I am happy to let the rest of you ask a question or share a comment. Ron, go right ahead. I was just uh, curious, as the, as the print papers are shrinking, how do you see your existing job and the future 
for photojournalism. Uh, you know, that's a concern because when you look at the paper, it does wonderful work, wonderful articles. Um, in, in the case of the BDN, it, it really deals uh, effectively statewide. And, uh, uh, you know, I personally appreciate that it's, you know, privately held, not a, a large conglomerate paper. But then I look at individuals just like any of us, and w we have a job and we want to support family. So how do you see your future and the future of photojournalism? Ooh. That's big. It is. <laughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, I, I honestly think that one of the benefits that we have here is, as you said, Bangor Daily News being a community newspaper, family owned. I feel like that's to our advantage um, and that's going to keep us around longer. Um, I, I do think that at some point the print paper will be gone. But by that point, my hope is that digitally, we are so well established that we are, like we are now, we still have, we have our online, you know, paper, we have the print paper, so that we keep doing our job in photojournalism, and it's, it's all online, when there is no print paper. I myself hope print papers around for quite a bit longer. I, I love the print paper. That's what I started in. Um, but I, I realize that that's a lot of hope and <laughs> for me for how long for how long well, that lasts. But <laughs> that's what we got. That's what we have. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, uh, because I work in Portland, a lot of my best stuff never sees print because the print product isn't really geared for Portland. It's geared for you know north of Augusta. And so sometimes I do manage to get like a front page photo or the state section and they run it big and it still gives me a thrill in a way that <laughs> is everything online is it's nice, but everything's the same size. And most people are seeing it that small, real tiny. Yeah. So seeing it in print, um, I'll never get over how good that feels ever. I hope not anyway. Who else has a question or a comment? There must be somebody. Somebody says, uh, how do you keep your, uh, your technical skills or yeah. continuing education? YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> I learn everything from YouTube. <laughs> There's some kid who unboxed the camera that morning and knows all the switches and dials by the afternoon. <laughs> but honestly, the, the, the controls on my camera are the same controls that were on the first film camera I have. It's still just shutter and aperture and ISO. And everything else is just I don't know, crazy. Don't, don't you think, Linda? Yeah, it is. It's the same thing, uh, except they added the video mode. <laughs> well, yeah, video. We had to learn to edit video, but that's, yeah, we did. You can learn to. It's just it's just software and stuff. It's it, it's not your eyeball. It's not your journalism instincts. It's not that part of Linda that makes her okay with talking to strangers. I feel like anybody could learn to operate a camera. It's the other part that's much harder. I think. Jonathan, do you have a question? Oh uh, yes, or I comment? do. Go ahead. Oh uh, yes, um, a bit of background. I was a, a photojournalist in 1972, covering the Goldwater LBJ election a, a while back. Uh, what my question is now, it's a little unnerving uh, with these public demonstrations uh, what has uh, been the uh, change in relationship uh, with law enforcement? It was not an issue or consideration in my day, but I suspect very much it is a problem now. Could the, uh, could the uh, two photographers discuss this? Are you meaning you th it, it appears that it's a problem with law enforcement and us in our profession? <laughs> yes. That they uh, get in your way, they you're in danger of being arrested or pushed aside or whatever. I have I have never had experiences with that, um, and maybe it's it's maybe here in Maine that it's, it's a better working relationship. I I can't speak on that because I've never had a bad experience with law enforcement while I'm on my job or otherwise <laughs> that sounded bad <laughs> uh, anyway um 
and uh, and mm. actually at the at the other places, I've never had a, a bad incident with law enforcement on my job. Troy, I, well, I've been I've been threatened with arrest on a number of occasions, but not all that seriously. And I don't know, police are, in my experience they're just like everybody else and this sounds awful but if you're doing a story they like they're helpful and if you're doing one they don't like they're not helpful but that's the same with everybody that i approach or have to deal with in the job i did get threatened with arrested at a blm protest this this uh this past june and i was photographing some police arresting somebody across the street and there was a really young uh young guy next to me he had a cell phone with a microphone on it and he was filming them doing he was standing next to me filming them and the cops you know told us to get out of there they're going to arrest us the paddy wagon was on its way and they got plenty of room for you guys you know stuff like that that they're shouting across the street at us and i have a press badge on and it says press i'm pretty sure and i've been there all night they know i'm with the press but the kid said to me um he says they can't do that right you're with the press and I said, <laughs> man, they can do anything they want. I mean, they're the cops. They have guns. So you just gotta, I've had to a couple of times just decide whether it was important enough to make a stink or not. And it's almost never, it's not ever really been that serious. I just told a sort of serious story, but I've never felt that threatened. Okay. All right, thank you both. Sure, yeah, that's a good question. Um, our colleague, Natalie, um, is here on the call with us and I think she um, she was in Bangor during one of the protests. Um, do you have anything that you can add to uh, Jonathan's question, Natalie? Yeah, sure. Um, so I covered the Black Lives Matter and George Floyd protest um, in June and I think similar to Troy, it definitely got contentious. There were definitely moments where, you know, things were tense. I think for me as the one of the newer people out in the field. I think one of my most important things I did that day was establish with the police who were there who I was so that they knew that I was still around, that I was still hanging around because of my job and not because I was part of the protest. And I think that distinction was important for me to make. Um, I personally haven't run into any issues, but it definitely, there have been times that it's been kind of tense and, you know, it's just kind of part of the job when you are at a contentious protests during a pandemic, during a big civil rights movement. Um, it kind of just goes with the territory. Sure. Isha, did you, Isha, did you have anything you wanted to add? Isha was there um, in Bangor as well. Um, you need to unmute yourself, Isha. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I was the reporter uh, along with Natalie at the Black Lives Matter protest. And then uh, when President Trump was in Maine, uh, I was at the airport where there was actually the largest gathering of people uh, in Bangor, even bigger than the Black Lives Matter protest eventually. Um, and it got tense because there was uh, there were federal um, the federal law enforcement agencies like Border Patrol was there, uh, and it was really contentious. They they brought out like Troy said they brought out all the the vans and started warning journalists that we're going to be arrested if we don't leave. And, you know, you can't leave uh, when that's happening. So we were like, well, well, we'll see what happens. And then the only reason the tension was broken was because uh, President Trump's helicopter flew out of Bangor and all the protesters got distracted and started yelling and that the police took that as a moment to just, you know, uh, just step back because it would have it was like this close to getting really dangerous but I mean you know it's it kind of for me as a reporter it kind of comes with the job like you know what you're signing up for it doesn't mean you're not afraid but you you have to be there to tell the story because it's important and you know thank you so much Isha and Natalie for um coming to the event and sharing your experiences it definitely is a team effort creating a creating the news at the BDN. Well, it is six o'clock and our time has come to an end. I wanted to thank all of you for joining. Thank you, Linda and Troy, for sharing your photos and being willing to talk about what it's like being a photojournalist in Maine. And um, now when you, when you 
tune into the BDN or get the paper. Maybe you'll take a closer look at who took those photos and now you'll have, um, you'll have a face and a, uh, to go with that name. So thank you all for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. We have some more events coming up this month, so stay tuned. And I hope you all have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Bye, Jack. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs>